Morning all, welcome to Sky News Breakfast. And after a turbulent week for Boris Johnson, it's been revealed a senior Conservative backbencher who accused government figures of blackmail and intimidation will meet with police officers next week. William Wragg claims that individuals within government intimidated MPs who questioned the Prime Minister's position. All this as Number 10 braces itself for the expected delivery next week of the Sue Gray report into lockdown parties in Downing Street. Speaking to The Telegraph, Mr Wragg said, I stand by what I have said. No amount of gaslighting will change that. The offer of Number 10 to investigate is kind, but I shall leave it to the experts. I am meeting the police early next week. Our political correspondent, Joe Pike, has the detail. The allegations that William Ragg made on Thursday morning were extraordinary, explosive. He says that some of his Conservative MP uh, colleagues, in particular those who potentially want a vote of confidence in Boris Johnson, have been subjected to bullying and intimidation that may, he argues, constitute blackmail, although Boris Johnson and some of his Cabinet ministers have said they have seen no evidence for that. Now, in a story first reported in The Telegraph and confirmed in a conversation I have had with William Ragg, he says that next week, early next week, he's meeting with an officer, a detective from the Metropolitan Police to discuss these allegations, although that does not necessarily mean an investigation will be launched. Why is he doing this? Well, partly because he doesn't want to be uh, bullied himself. He wants this to be taken seriously. There has certainly, over the last 24 hours, been a pretty uh, brutal briefing campaign against against him. That is not abnormal uh, here in Westminster, but it certainly helps substantiate uh, some of his claims about the uh, culture within uh, this place. He's also doing this because, of course, he believes that a crime or crimes potentially have been committed. And this is clearly an escalation uh, in the battles that are going on within the Conservative Party in Westminster, battles that don't really seem particularly sustainable at this point. And that is before we get to next week, where we are expecting that all-important report from Sue Gray about events and parties that have taken place within a government, and in particular, within Number 10. Joe Pike there. Uh, the United Nations has condemned a, uh, an airstrike by a Saudi-led coalition on a Yemeni detention centre that has killed more than 70 people. The facility, which is in a stronghold of the rebel Houthi movement, was struck on Friday. But the Saudi official news agency is now saying the coalition was not targeting the centre. Now, the UN Secretary General has called for an investigation Another deadly day in the war between Saudi-led coalition forces and the Houthi rebels, which has been going on since 2015. Sky's Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle reports. These are pictures broadcast by a Houthi-controlled television channel, but it's clear what happened. The building has been totally flattened. They're picking through the rubble, but by now, and with the resources they've got, there is little chance of finding anyone alive. It was a detention centre run by the Iranian-backed Houthis, but many of the inmates were civilian refugees who had been fleeing the fighting. We consider this a war crime against humanity. The world should take its responsibility at this critical moment in human history. We are witnessing many victims. The number of dead keeps going up. One local hospital treated around 200 of the wounded, but then shut its doors because it couldn't cope anymore. The airstrikes are retaliation for Houthi drones that exploded close to Abu Dhabi International Airport on Monday, killing three people. What we need is to stop this vicious circle in which things get escalating one after the other. What we need uh, is to have, as we have been proposing uh, from long ago, a ceasefire together with the opening of harbour and uh, uh, airports and uh, then uh, the beginning of a serious dialogue among the parties. This escalation needs to stop. Yesterday, there were huge protests in the rebel-held capital Sana'a as Yemen faces yet another phase of violence in this long-running conflict. Seven years of devastating war tens of thousands dead, and yet still it goes on. 
Alistair Bunkle there. Uh, Russia and the United States have agreed to continue talks over the future of Ukraine, slightly easing fears of conflict in Eastern Europe. Russia's foreign minister said he was waiting for security guarantees from the US, which should be provided next week. The United States Secretary of State warned that any incursion across Ukraine's border would be a renewed invasion and would be met with a severe response. From there, our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey reports. It's over a thousand miles long. The frozen border between Ukraine and Russia is divided by trenches and in places a thin metal fence and berm. The right hand side is Russia. A few miles away, across freezing fields and drifting snow, thousands of Russian soldiers, tanks and missile systems are waiting for orders. The Ukrainian border patrol says they continuously monitor Russian movements towards them. On the face of it, they seem fairly unfazed by the prospect. As we film near the fence, a Russian border patrol passed nearby. The two sides are that close. Well, it put it in, puts it in perspective how close we are to Russia, because that is the Russian border security uh, patrolling. Um, we've been with the Ukrainian side, and there they are. Um, both sides right next to each other, as you can see. I didn't expect to see them, I have to be honest. But uh, the Ukrainians say that they do the same job as them, and they do see each other quite often. Of course not with this sort of underlying tension uh, that uh, the world is seeing right now. And that tension deepened here in the regional capital, Kharkiv, when Ukraine's president said he thought that this country's second city could well be targeted by President Putin if he decides to invade. Young professionals like Viktor and Yulia say they, like all their friends, are genuinely scared now. Yulia has volunteered to become a battlefield medic. Like on the edge of something very terrible, and scaring. So, yes, I I can say that kind of scared. And you know, Russians live by a war, but by their huge imperial ambitions. But Ukrainians, yeah, I agree with Victor, we're a really peaceful nation. But in case if someone tries to took our freedom again, we will fight back. Quite what a full-scale invasion would look like isn't known. Russian tanks could come straight across these frozen farmlands. What's equally unknown is for how long the Ukrainian army can resist. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Eastern Ukraine. Some of the day's other news now. and More than 300 migrants attempting to reach Europe have been rescued by the Italian Coast Guard. Their overloaded boat ran into difficulty off the Mediterranean island of Lampedusa. Those rescued included 17 women and six children. A New York police officer has been killed and another injured responding to a domestic disturbance. A suspect was also killed in the shooting in Harlem. An anonymous official said a call had come in shortly after 5 p.m. of a mother needing help with her son. The boyfriend of Gabby Petito admitted to killing her in a notebook discovered near his body in Florida, according to the FBI. It's the first time that authorities have firmly placed the blame of Mrs. Petito, sorry, Ms. Petito's death on Brian Laundrie. Jab cabs and booster buses. Uh, what are they? Well, they're the latest initiatives being rolled out to encourage people to get their COVID-19 jab. Sky's Milena Veselinovic is in the newsroom for us and is standing by to explain exactly what a booster bus might be. 
Indeed. Well, the NHS says that vaccine hesitancy isn't the reason why some people simply hadn't gotten round to getting their vaccine yet. Some, some simply can't afford to get to their appointments, they say. So for that reason, they are rolling out these free cabs for people in Manchester, Birmingham and certain boroughs in London where the take-up has been lower. There's also going to be shuttle buses taking people to appointments in uh, both Surrey and Somerset and free bus strips in Nottinghamshire, Suffolk and Blackpool. And for those who need a little extra encouragement, well, now there are two brothers who are pharmacists in Kent, but also have a popular restaurant, and they will be giving out kebabs with each jab. So the NHS really throwing everything in order to bolster the vaccine uptake ahead of Plan B restrictions lifting next Thursday. We know this is a government that is relying on vaccines entirely in order to live alongside COVID, and for that they will need near universal coverage. And they are hoping that these latent incentives. We'll get them at least some way towards that. Melena, thank you. Uh, well, let's stay with COVID. And a sub-variant of the Omicron strain has been designated as a variant under investigation by UK officials. Known as BA2, the number of cases is currently low, with Omicron still the dominant strain in the UK. Professor Mike Tilsley is an epidemiologist at the University of Warwick and he joins us once again on the programme. Professor, good to see you this morning. I um, wonder if we could start with this sub-variant. What is it and how concerned, if at all, should we be? Yeah, so, I mean, for the first thing I should say, whenever these sorts of things happen, I do say that um, the virus mutates all the time. So, mm. throughout the pandemic, we have seen new variants or sub-variants, which are kind of smaller changes to the virus, occur. When these happen, most of these variants are sort of no different from the previous variants that have been circulating. This variant, this sort of sublineage of the of the Omicron variant, is becoming well. It's becoming the dominant um, subvariant in Denmark. Around about fifty percent of the cases now appear to be of this subvariant. It may be that there's slight evidence that it's a little bit more transmissible, but given that it's been circulating in the UK since uh, December. It looks like even if it is a little bit more transmissible, it doesn't appear to be that much more so. And also the evidence coming out from Denmark does seem to be that there is no particular increased risk of hospitalisation or that the vaccines will be less effective. So I think not particularly of concern at the moment, but of course, as with any situation with these emergence of variants, very important to monitor it over the next sort of few days to just really ascertain what the risk is. Uh, good to have you putting that into a little bit of context, Professor. Um, so let's let's talk, shall we, about the relaxation of of COVID restrictions. We have we now understand that within a well within a matter of a couple of weeks we will be pretty much back to normal in terms of the way that we live our lives o on the basis of the data, in terms of hospitalisations, in terms of deaths. Is this the right point at which to to move away from Plan B? Yeah, and I think it's a really hard call, and I suspect really not my place to say whether it's the right time to move to Plan B or Indeed. not. But actually looking at the data, which I think is sort of my role, really, we look. let's look at the cases. They are going down, actually, um, in all the regions now. The north of England, a little bit behind other parts um, of, of England. Um, hospital emissions are also on the way down. Now, of course, important to point, to the, point out that any relaxation will slow that rate of decline, as has happened again throughout the pandemic. My hope is that now that the cases have turned around, that we will be looking at purely slowing rather than causing cases to increase again. The one um, sort of caveat to this is what's going on in schools, and particularly primary schools, that we are seeing a rise in cases amongst younger children at the moment. My hope is that this is just a smaller surge as a result of a return of children to school. And over the next few weeks, we start to see those turn around again, but very important for us to monitor that situation in schools over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, just, just on that topic, um, given that, of course, so many of the, so many children, you know, particularly the under 12s, will not have been, have been vaccinated. Is there a risk as we start to learn to live with COVID, as the Prime Minister and others have said, that you know, under 12s could essentially just serve to keep reseeding Omicron or whatever might be the dominant variant into the population? Well, of course, the first thing we should say on this is that um, yeah, children are relatively um, sort of low risk in terms of getting um, getting severe symptoms should they get infected. And that still remains the case. But of course, 
if they are they are still a relatively susceptible population. And actually, it's interesting at the moment comparing the situation between primary age children and secondary age children, because of course, secondary school age children in general over 12s are mostly vaccinated, and we're not seeing the same high number of cases in secondary school age children as we are in primary at the moment. So um, there is obviously a concern that there is spread amongst younger children. Um, hopefully, we are just seeing a wave now that will eventually turn over as we get towards the spring. But of course, with that susceptible population, there is a risk that infection will then expose older people um, sort of indirectly to infection. So really important for us to monitor that. Uh, you may well have heard, Professor, just before uh, you came on air, me discussing with uh, uh, my correspo uh, our, our correspondent colleague, uh, Milena, the, the booster buses and the jab cabs, just the latest attempt to try and get people to, to take up the vaccine. Sh should we read into this that there is some concern that vaccination uptake in certain communities in certain parts of the country isn't quite where it could be? Oh, well, I mean, I've been sort of making this point probably for about six to nine months now that on the whole, of course, on a national level, vaccine uptake has been fantastic. And actually, the vaccine rollout for the last 12 months has been one of the sort of shining lights of the vaccination of the of the campaigns of the control campaign in the UK. So it has been incredible how many people have come forward. But of course, you're quite right that that is variable. There are certain communities where uptake is a little bit lower. Um, booster vaccination campaign has gone very well, but there are still hard to reach communities that do need to come forward and access the vaccine. And the problem is that with high levels of vaccine across the country, if there are certain communities where uptake is low, there is the risk of sustained infection in those communities and potentially risk to the more vulnerable in those communities. So it's very important that the government does what they can to get out and get to those hard-to-reach communities and hopefully improve vaccine uptake. Professor Mike Toadsley uh, from the University of Warwick, good to see you again. Uh, thanks for joining us. No problem. Uh, a few of the day's other news stories now, and uh, new pictures have emerged from Tonga, where life-saving supplies have been delivered by New Zealand's Navy. Boats docked in the island's capital almost a week after a huge volcanic eruption triggered a tsunami. The ship was carrying 250,000 litres of water and the equipment to produce 70,000 more litres every day. And well, as you can see, there were somewhat chaotic scenes in Honduras's Congress after a brawl broke out during the swearing-in of a new congressional president. Members of the leftist Libre Party fought amongst themselves after Congressman Jorge Calix was elected as Congress president instead of Louis Redondo. Interesting story, this. A third of motorists are not aware that the highway code is changing next week, according to a survey by the AA. The code, which contains advice and rules for people on Britain's roads, is due to be update, updated on the 29th of January, with new guidance for drivers on overtaking cyclists or horses and more responsibility to be aware of pedestrians. The actor and former governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, has, been repo has reportedly been involved in a car accident that left one person injured. The 74-year-old former bodybuilder was in a Yukon SUV, one of four cars involved in the crash on Sunset Boulevard. The producers of James Bond have said the British actor Idris Elba is part of the conversation to become the next 007. Barbara Broccoli addressed the speculation over who will next play Bond after she was told a lot of fans want to see Idris Elba in a tuxedo. Other actors thought to be in the running for the highly sought-after role include Tom Hardy and Henry Cavill. Social media companies are under pressure to remove anti-vaccination material from their sites over fears that young people could refuse vaccines because of it. Research has found that two-thirds of anti-vax propaganda posted online is created by just 12 so-called influencers. UK ministers have been urged to take tougher action, such as introducing fines to social media companies that spread disinformation. Our political correspondent Kate McCann reports. The anger, the fear, the division. With COVID-19 has come a new anti-vaccination movement. Distinct from those who are vaccine-hesitant, anti-vax propaganda is designed to do harm. The best anti-vaxxers are really good marketers too. So, look, the actual algorithms that, that, that underpin social media platforms, 
they know that conspiracy theories are sticky, which is that once you've had one, you want to know more about it because they're new, they're exciting, they're different. And so they feed you more and more. And we found that in our studies. We found the actual algorithm recommending and feeding people more and more conspiracy theories. Young people who live more of their lives than ever before online are prime targets for anti-vaxxers and teachers worry the pull of the internet is too strong to counter without help from the government. They obviously look on social media, they see quite a lot of jokes, I think. On Instagram, TikTok, there's lots of jokes about, oh, get my vaccine and then this happens to me. I think it still has an effect on them that they think, well, actually, you know, instead of vaccines being something quite dull, boring and necessary, it's something that is controversial, weird and slightly alarming. Ministers are promising tough new measures, including fines to stop anti-vax videos online, but they accept policing the internet is a difficult task. The internet is a large space and there is definitely more to do. And in fact, in uh, the coming months, we're going to be introducing a piece of legislation, the Online Safety Bill, to go even further in imposing statutory legal duties on social media firms to make sure they act in this area. Labour says ministers must get tougher legislation is a first and necessary step to this and it would send a clear message to those tech companies that we will not stand for inaction on disinformation and misinformation especially on something as important as the covid vaccine i would urge everybody to speak to registered medical professionals if you are hesitant about getting the vaccine please don't listen to somebody on social media purporting to know the truth Social media isn't real life. Some people may never see anti-vax material, but those who do can find themselves sucked in without realising, and it's changing the way we think about medicine, science, and whether we trust our politicians. Kate McCann, Sky News. A benefit concert will be held at the Barbican in London tonight to raise awareness and funds to support the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Well, the concert comes at a time when the Taliban have seized control of most of the country. Performing at the bar uh, Barbican will be the Afghan-born rubab player Homayun Saki, along with Sara Karimi, who fled the country with her three nieces on August the 15th. Our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. <laughs> Musician Humayun Saki was born in Kabul and plays the rabab, the national instrument of Afghanistan. This weekend it'll be heard on stage at a benefit concert in London. But for those living in Afghanistan, it is a sound they no longer get to hear. Posted on social media, in charge once more, this is the Taliban's reaction to those who play music. Honestly, when I saw that, <laughs> I, I, in that time, I feel like I, they are boring my heart. Our people, uh, they need peace, they need music. They don't have money and they don't have anything to sometimes you know, help them. When the Taliban were last in power, they banned all forms of music making apart from religious singing. Now they've resumed control, they've already introduced a ban on music in public places, with many musicians leaving Afghanistan for their own survival. Almost two decades after they were ousted by a US-led coalition, as the Taliban took over Kabul, scenes at the airport became increasingly desperate. From those that made it onto planes, relief. For those left behind, this is what replaced the music. Mirwai Siddiqui is a former director of two music schools in Afghanistan which shut down overnight. The faces of the musicians and students seen here now need to be blurred for their own safety. Taliban actually officially announced that the musicians have to change uh, their profession. Uh, so uh, they are not allowed to perform, they are not allowed to do any, any musical event. Uh, they are afraid. <laughs> In hiding and without work, in Afghanistan this winter, campaigners say musicians are starving to death. And there is frustration that while their suffering made front page news last summer, now nobody seems to be listening. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Now, I think it's fair to say Netflix became pretty popular during lockdown. 
with more of us staying home and binge watching shows to pass the time. But it was a poor end to 2021 for the streaming giant, with a slowdown in subscribers, meaning its shares took a plunge. And of course, it is not the only kid on the block these days. Uh, here to tell us more about the world of streaming, I'm joined by Tony Maroulis from Ampere Analysis. Tony, great to see you this morning. Um, can we just start with possibly the biggest question in all of this? Why has Netflix share price uh, had such a dramatic plunge? I mean, as I understand it, they're still putting on subscribers, just perhaps not quite as many as they'd hoped. Yeah, I mean, we, I really can't comment specifically on the share price, uh, but generally speaking, the OTT space has become a lot more competitive over the past two years. So in the past, it was just Netflix and Amazon dominating the space. Now we get the new entrants from Disney, from uh, with Disney Plus, of course, from uh, Warner Media with HBO Max and uh, Paramount Plus from Viacom, CBS, and others. So inevitably, so, the the market is becoming a lot more competitive, and uh, that's to some extent reflected. So it, it, it is a case then. All of these uh, new entrants to the market, everyone is creating their own content these days. That's where perhaps you know studios like Netflix can perhaps you know steal a march on their rivals. Yeah, they certainly have. I mean, Netflix has been producing original titles since 2013. In fact, they've spent nearly $17 billion since 2013 up until 2021 only on original content, producing their own like, slate of um, uh, popular content has been very successful. And over the next five years, we actually expect at Ampere Analysis that Netflix is going to spend about $50 billion more uh, dollars on content uh, to basically continue bolstering up their, uh, their content catalog. Just in terms of, of habits amongst the viewing public, I mean, are people sticking to one streaming service, maybe two? I mean, I won't tell you how many things I'm subscribed to at the moment, but it's certainly more than I should be. Yeah, I mean, asphalt stacking or, you know, subscribing to more than one service, kind of dipping in and out of the various uh, content and uh, service that you want is a definitely a common phenomenon. So as a subscriber, are taking more and more services and it's just commonplace now. This is why you get... Uh, partnerships with pay TV operators and uh, OTT sticks and that kind of stuff is becoming very important because the consumer ultimately wants a single device to access all its, all their content from for the sake of convenience and ease. Where are the growth markets then for these streaming giants? They must continually be trying to identify new market opportunities. Uh, one suspects that you know there are still parts of the world where they don't have perhaps the penetration that they might have wanted. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, generally speaking, I mean, if we look at Netflix in isolation, for example, in North America, around half of the households in the, in the United States actually have a Netflix subscription, which is incredibly high. In Western Europe, it's not quite as high. It's about one in three. Or it's, it will be around, uh, around that by the end of 2022. And obviously, all the other markets are a little bit further behind. But outside of the United, uh, United States, where perhaps it's hit a bit of a saturation point, but even their subscriptions are growing, there is plenty of room for, for, to grow for Netflix, and particularly in developing markets where it's very underpenetrated. Uh, well, Tony, I take it from what you're saying there, we, we should not be anticipating the demise of Netflix as a massive player in terms of global media anytime soon. Oh, absolutely not. No, they're doing great. In fact, um, even though they're not necessarily growing that many subscriptions in the United States, their revenues are doing very well. So in, oh, in 2021, they grew their revenues by 11%, uh, while their subscriptions only grew by two. So even if they're not, they're, they're not growing their subscriptions at as high of a pace, it's not like they're making any less money. Tony Maroulis from Ampere Analysis, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Time to see how the weather is looking this weekend. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. At mostly dry and settled conditions this weekend, however, it will be rather cloudy with just a few brighter spells. Most places having a cloudy start, some light rain in the north, there will be a patch of frost and a few fog patches in the south and the east. Fine and dry with sunny spells in the cooler south and east today. Elsewhere, milder but cloudier with some patchy drizzle over western hills. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, with us this morning to review the papers once again, the former editor of The Daily Star, Don Neeson, and the broadcaster and writer, Edward Adu. And Edward, we're coming to you first this hour. Um, story in the Mail Online, Geoffrey Cox, a name people will be familiar yeah. with. I think the, num the amount of money that he earns, uh, frankly, most people will be unfamiliar with. So this is about um, Sir Geoffrey Cox. He's the... Um, so, yeah, it's about the... He was involved in the second job scandal. Now, he's declared further earnings for some work that he's been doing 
Um, and he represented the British Virgin Islands government in a corruption inquiry. Now, some may say, you know, if you're doing uh, secondary work, uh, depending on the amount, it's OK. But I mean, this is a staggering nearly £1,393 an hour, nearly, uh, I mean, he earned nearly 50 grand from this. Now, some have questioned whether, you know, MPs, there should be a cap when it comes to um, second earnings or, or second jobs. I mean, especially in the times that we're going through, a lot of people are not, uh, some people have lost their work and not many people are able to earn that amount. And it's caused um, controver uh, con controversy about this. And I mean, it is a staggering amount. I mean, in November, the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, Catherine Stone, was asked to investigate the earnings, but that that didn't take place. And I'm not sure whether this will sort of, you know, beg the question for not just parliamentarians or other MPs to say, well, look, um, in terms of us, as seen by the public, it, you know, is this a good thing? And whether there has to be a cap in place, because I mean, his, uh, his he he earns over eighty-one thousand. So in a sense. If he does three or four days work, he's literally earning what he earns uh, his annual salary as an MP. Yeah, I, I will confess that I've always been slightly confused as to how it benefits constituents to have your MP being paid to do another job. Um, but let's go, shall we, uh, Don, to the front of the independent. And, and I suspect that this will be a story that it doesn't really matter which side of the political divide you fall on. It, it, it has a lot of truth to it. Brand Boris damaged irreparably by all this scandal. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, waking up again to uh, more Boris. You can't avoid Boris. It's in every single newspaper. Interesting. I picked the Independent because the headline, brand Boris damaged permanently by the scandal, several scandals, obviously. And it's interesting they call him brand Boris because he is a brand, isn't he? I mean, you know, out of all the, the, the prime ministers we've had, I'm just trying to think of others that could be, you know, classed as a brand. And Tony Blair, possibly, certainly not Theresa May. Um, but this is interesting. It's, it's, you know, has Boris personally been completely damaged by party gate, the hypocrisy, uh, David Davis, uh, you know, who, who said, you know, in the name, in the name of God, go, um, Christian Wakeford, the, um, the first defection from the Labour in 15 years, um, and everything, you know, all the scandals surrounding him and, you know, the fact that we, we do know that Boris tells lies and isn't quite sure what the party is. So this is basically an interview with Lord Hayward, who's a Tory peer and an elections guru, so knows what he's talking about. And he is saying that basically Brand Boris is irreparably damaged. And if Boris is still in charge come the next January election, and I know we're all waiting for that one, aren't we? Um, the, the Conservatives probably will not win because Boris is there. However, Neil, he does counter this by saying that the bounce back from the vaccine rollout, which is the one huge success that Boris and the Tory party can claim, and also the freedoms now that we have emerged from, certainly in England, and I know Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland are catching upwards, um, the bounce back of the freedoms that we now have and coming out of the pandemic might just save Boris's skin. So it's a balancing act. On one mm. hand, you have all the controversy, and on the other hand, you have the feel-good factor of coming out of the pandemic. Hopefully, please God, we stay out of it. So it's it's going to be very interesting. But, you know, brand Boris, is this the end? And I think it's a question that no matter what side of the political debate you're on, yeah. you're going to be asking yourself, certainly, until Sue Gray's report comes out on the parties, which is, I think, going to happen next week. I am on tenterhooks for that moment. Um, Edward, you, your story from the Mirror Online, actually quite a timely one. Our correspondent Andy Hughes is a special running all day today about knife crime in London. This, uh, a knifing taking place inside Selfridges, of all places. A place where many of us go to families, uh, it would probably be a day out for some families, and for, for that to happen, for, for two people for, to, to be, to, to be get embroiled in a fight and they get stabbed, it's just, it's just shocking. And the, the problem with um, stabbings in London, it seems to be spiralling out of control. Already, or last year, we had 30 deaths. And over the years, I mean, I've come across stories, not just uh, from doing my radio shows, but generally talking about um, the impact of knife crime and how it can, what can be done in order to try and defuse this. But for this to happen in the centre of London, in Oxford Street, it's just worrying, it's just shocking. And uh, I mean, they've been calls not just for the Mayor of London, but for governments to, to take 
action to make to to try and defuse this. But I mean, for this to kind of happen um, in the centre of London, where tourists, families in a well-known department store, um, I'm, I'm, you know, lost for words. I just, just hope that there is a, a a formula to try and to, to eradicate this because it can't go on any longer. Yeah, you just hope that London perhaps gets its act together in the way that Glasgow did a few years ago with the, the Violence Reduction Unit. Um, Don, take us to the Times. This is a this is an interesting one because, in fact, strangely enough, I questioned uh, Quasi Quartang about it yet on the programme yesterday morning. There are a number of schools which are still continuing to insist that their pupils wear masks. What's the PM saying about it? Well, the Prime Minister is telling schools that they have to ditch face masks in the classroom. And this story has been uh, around all week. As we know, when we were given our freedoms back earlier on this week, it was like face masks in classrooms were one of the few things, one of the first things to absolutely go. And in my opinion, quite rightly so. I think children have suffered enough and I think it does affect their education and various studies have backed that up. However, this is Nadim Tahawi, the Education Secretary, is now overseeing plans by local directors of public health to bring back secondary school face coverings in areas where there are COVID-19 rises. Now, he is taking personal charge of this, and, but he has said, like, you can make, to, to schools, he said, you can make a decision about whether you um, ask pupils to wear masks in, in communal areas in your schools, However, if you are going to try and enforce face masks back in the classroom, if there is a COVID peak in your area, you have to liaise directly with me. Naturally, the education unions are doing what they do and saying, this is wrong, this is mad, we can't do this, etc., etc. But the bottom line with this is, Neil, is that, you know, 80% of pupils feel that wearing a face covering affects their education. And surely the most important thing here is, after the two years that they have had, that, that students of all ages, certainly those coming up to their exams this year, um, we know they've been messed about so much, yeah. actually get back to getting a proper education. Edward, I, I really want you to squeeze in this story from page <laughs> page 37 of the Daily Mail. You know, you're going for the big stories Neil, when it's is, page 37. Yes, going for the biggies. Yeah, M&M's go woke. This, go on, you've got 30 this seconds. Is <laughs> this has blown my mind. Now, I've never seen M&Ms in this light. Apparently, they're having a revamp because they need to make themselves more friendly, more diverse. I mean, chocolate is chocolate right, Neil, but apparently it's not the case. So they're having a revamp because apparently one of the characters uh, is deemed to be too sexy and the other one doesn't look right. And it, 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 it makes which us is feel which? anxious. I don't I'm... know where we're going... So which is so which, Edward? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Which one's the sexy one? So apparently the green one is too sexy and possibly <laughs> flirts with the brown one. I mean, can you help me out with this, Neil? I mean, it's chocolate. No, um, <laughs> actually, no, I can't, I'm afraid.